Good morning from New York. I'm Stefan Schweinfest, the director of the statistics division. I'm very happy to be here together with this uh, intrepid core team. I mean, you are the network. I mean, we, uh, we've we had so many activities and sprints and we see each other in so many forms and in incarnations and so many activities. It's hard to believe that this is only the second actually official virtual meeting of the uh, network itself. So uh, many of you are now real experienced uh, old timers of this activities and I hardly need to remind you that this goes back to our uh, big discussion on how to improve the overall effectiveness and efficiency of the system of economic statistics globally uh, in the discussions of the Statistical Commission in 2021 already. It's now been two years. Uh, the network has been very, very active. The network presented a report to the last Statistical Commission session in the, uh, this year in March. And then, as usual, uh, the Statistical Commission, and I wanted to thank everybody, not to forget that, um, who made uh, contributions not only to the work of the network, but also to the reporting of the network and writing it up and bringing it back to our mothership, the Statistical Commission. The Statistical Commission gave us uh, a number of suggestions, homework, um, decisions of the Commission, and those are basically the battle plan for today's, uh, this is a bit of an executive board type of meeting. So if we look at uh, what the Commission basically told us, uh, that this will define our agenda for today, we have first uh, exploring the feasibility of a research agenda for a new integrated statistical framework for measuring inclusive and sustainable well-being as outlined in the background document, which was presented by this uh, network to the Commission, um, the research prospectus for such an integrated framework, uh, which was the result um, of the GDP uh, and beyond sprints. So that is one topic, that package. Then the second topic, organizing an international classification sprint to raise awareness of the importance of international classifications. Third package, uh, developing a branding, communication and outreach strategy to raise awareness of the objectives of and activities of this network as part of the global statistical uh, system and beyond, of course, or I mean, I think in the meantime, we do include in the global statistical system, the academia and private sector. Fourth package, um, implementation of data access use cases of industry specific studies of global value chains using privately held data to advance methods and principles of data access in close cooperation with the private sector, data access, big topic. And uh, lastly, a continuation of regional and global consultations on shared uh, statistical priorities and collaborative uh, uh, arrangements. So those were the five points basically that are reflected in the Commission document uh, directed in our uh, direction. And now we will take them up basically one by one. Um, let me just make one or two remarks ahead of that. Uh, collaboration is key for the network. A network, as the name expresses, connects everything. So uh, we can't, as a network, do anything alone in the field of economic statistics. So we, I think it is very wise to look for strategic partnerships. And this is already happening left, right and center. So I want to really acknowledge that. Examples are the um, outreach and collaboration with the newly formed uh, Friends of the Chair Group on Social and Demographic Statistics uh, uh, in the context of the GDP and Beyond Sprints uh, 2023. Then the collaboration with the UN Committee on Experts on International Statistical Classifications and uh, forming a joint task team with the UN Committee of Experts on Big Data and Data Science uh, in the context of the data access discussions and so. So, and of course, uh, the classical cooperation with our friends and partners in the area of national accounting, environmental accounting and environmental statistics is, is a given. So I really, uh, um, I think this network uh, will be strongest if it 
builds on what is already out there and really literally connects and augments what is there and adds value. So um, I think uh, we will look at the 2023 proposed work program as a result of these uh, proposals by the Statistical Commission during the agenda here. And I would like you, you are the cockpit of the network, uh, to give us your advice, your opinion, your feedback. Uh, are we covering everything we need to cover? Is something missing? Are we trying to do too much? Or if it is too much, what are clearly priorities? In which order can we do things? So those are the the, the, the elements where we really need uh, uh, your uh, advice. Uh, the network is also there are a number of proposals of process improvements which will be presented and we will hope uh, we hope that this will advance the network's raison d'etre to facilitate regional and national statistical systems to pivot towards producing more integrated socio-economic environmental and geospatial, geospatial data and statistics so just one last reflection on the use of sprints as a working method. I think this has been really uh, one of the characteristics of the network and it has really worked well. I think we can be very, very proud. We have done that in the past and we have had the four sprints where many of you were actively um, uh, p participating and contributing the organizational sprint access to private data beyond GDP 2022 and the measurement of inflation of owner occupied housing. So we have had far over 100 participants in virtually every session there and we can continue to brag because our first activity in 2023, the recently uh, held uh, first uh, GDP uh, sprint beyond GDP sprint uh, attracted 260 participants from around the globe. So uh, I know Richard will talk about this and I don't want to steal his thunder, but we are having another GDP and beyond uh, sprint this week. It's a high activity period for this network on the 15th of June. So if you haven't done so or uh, the, and you haven't registered or haven't uh, gotten the information, you can easily do that or contact our network secretariat. We have a very easy um, uh, email address. It's simply network of, network of economic statistics. It's nes at un.org for anything you always wanted to know about the network of economic statisticians. So thank you. In order to get this all going, we need a lot of people working in the background. I thank our two co-chairs, Shauda from the Maldives Bureau of Statistics and then Andre from Statistics Canada. They were driving this in the background with the strong support of Statistics Netherlands, UK, ONS, USBA, and our core team in the UN. Um, Today we are trying something new also as part of our regular board meeting, so to speak. We also have an inspiring keynote presentation on measuring uh, human capital by Robert Dunn of the UK Office of National Statistics. And we will see whether that works and helps uh, us. And then if this is a modality that inspires us and helps us, we can think about how we do that in the future. So thank you very much for being at the table, coming again and again to the table. I look very much forward to working with all of you, listening to your ideas. Today's program is really about the program 2023 and beyond. Our cycle is always a little bit into March of the following year with the Statistical Commission. And uh, so thanks for connecting. And I hand over the floor to Shahuda, who will chair us through the agenda and through the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, so uh, I would like to welcome uh, everybody to the second meeting of the network. Uh, so the main objective of today's meeting, uh, it's mainly to touch base with the network members and provide some updates on ongoing activities uh, as planned activities of the network 
and to get some feedback from members. So as Stefan has already highlighted uh, some of these uh, aspects. So with the participants, uh, we'll be provided uh, detailed information on an overview of the follow up work that has been resulted that has resulted uh, from completed sprints as well as this uh, sprints that are planned for this year and based on the decisions during the last session of the Statistical Commission. And this uh, network meeting is intended to serve as a mechanism that will provide regular frequent communication on current and emerging issues to network members uh, so that it's uh, easier for us to collaborate and work together. And we will have enough time allocated for discussions uh, on follow-up work from the report of the 54th session of the Statistical Commission and the initiatives to improve the network's communication and outreach activities. Uh, and uh, to kick off today's meeting, we have the great keynote presentation uh, as already highlighted. It's on measuring human capital in the national accounts and experimental approach. Uh, I hope we have an informative, engaging and participatory session and it will help improve the network's communication and outreach uh, going forward. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to our keynote speaker, Mr. Robert Dunn, to give his uh, present presentation on measuring human capital in the national accounts. Uh, it's about uh, uh, half an hour time, so let's uh, try to stick to the time. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thanks for inviting me to this meeting. Um, first off, can everyone see the slides? Yep, thumbs up. That's good. OK, um, so as Shahida said, this is looking at human capital and integrating it into the sequence of economic accounts and thinking about what does it actually mean if we have human capital as an asset. I should also say that this work was done as part of the Economic Statistics Centre of Excellence in the UK. So that was done to allow us to kind of push the boundaries a bit further than what would be normal within the National Statistics Institution. And so the opinions given in this presentation are mine and not necessarily those of the ONS. So what I intend to quickly cover in the next 30 minutes is some background on where human capital has got to, um, what guidance is available currently, and talk about um, the, the actual discussion paper. Uh, so within that, we're going to be also looking at some conceptual points to solve. So if we have human capital uh, as, as an asset, what does that mean? If we use the same principles of accounting as as uh, for all other assets, what does that mean? And we'll also talk through, are we now looking at a bit of a paradigm shift from labour input to, with, to this um, dichotomy between a labour input and a human capital asset input? And then we'll present some early experimental results um, using UK data and draw some conclusions. Right, so first off, ONS has produced human capital stock estimates for over a decade now with various demographic, demographic breakdowns and um, educational breakdowns and uh, and it's been improving the estimates um, over time. The current estimate is an income based approach and it covers an age range from 16 to 65. So we've had guidance in place on measuring human capital from the UNECE since 2016. And the work uh, in the discussion paper builds off of that um, measuring human capital guidance. So the, the work was initiated within the ONS's Beyond GDP work stream. It was kind of a thought experiment on 
If we take our ONS's current human capital estimates and we integrated those with the, the ONS's economic statistics in the institutional sector accounts, what would things look like? And what kind of issues and problems do we face? And what do we have to think about and solve? And then in May last year, we published um, through the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence, a discussion paper setting out the work and the, our thought experiment. So, and we've also had the System of National Accounts um, revision guidance, so WS4, I'm sure everyone on the call is aware of this one, and that has two main broad recommendations for the countries to develop a cost-based education measure in accordance with the recommendations in under education and training. So in, in essence, producing a satellite account for education and training. And within the discussion paper, this is our basis for having um, what is intermediate consumption for the production of human capital. So we're doing small steps to start with. We were taking our main inputs to producing human capital as being education and training while recognizing that there is probably wider scope to expand what's intermediate consumption for human capital. Uh, the second main recommendation in the guidance notes is to also produce a income-based monetary stock measure with gender, age and education detail. So in the again, in the discussion paper, it is the income approach based um, to human capital, which we use for the output estimate and therefore what goes to, as GFCF of human capital. And the difference between the cost based uh, approach on um, educate from education and training and the income based approach is our value added. So conceptual points. Um, so the general definition we're using is the one which was um, which is associated with the ONS's human capital output um, um, asset um, release. So we're looking at the knowledge, skills and competencies and other attributes embodied in an individual or groups of individuals acquired during their life and used to produce goods, services or, or ideas in market circumstances. And what we need to do to integrate human capital into the sequence of accounts is to consider what flows do we need to move between two balance sheet positions. So we need to think about transactions, what's our gross capital formation, depreciation, and associated transactions to make the sequence of accounts work when we're treating human capital as an asset. We have to think about revaluation, so nominal price effects. And we also have to think about other volume changes, so changes which are neither transactions or price related. Uh, th this is probably all not new for the people on this call, uh, but it's these things that we need to look at in the, the human with the human capital as an asset. Uh, right. So the first big thing to solve is where is it produced? As mentioned in the definition, we see human capital assets as being produced by the household sector due to the embodied nature of the asset. And this is one of the options which was given in the UNECE measuring human capital um, guidance um, manual. So our starting point is that human capital assets are produced in the household sector and embodied in people. And that then leads on to what are the inputs to uh, to create that human capital asset? As I, I mentioned just a moment ago, we're using inputs seen as education, uh, both state and private funded and purchase training. And we're using the structure given in the satellite ac uh, account on education and training to structure this education and purchase training. At the moment, we haven't got a estimate for in-house produced training. So it's 
that's one of the steps we want to push forward to get to include that. So it is at the moment our cost side is is on the state uh, state state and private funded and purchase training. Uh, because we've said that the human capital asset is produced in the household sector, we have to do some rerouting of that education and training. So state funded education needs to be reclassified to market output for it to be able to be moved to the household sector and used as an intermediate input. Uh, so that's the central government and local government sectors and some MPish sectors is, is really reclassified to market output and rerouted. Purchase training uh, is counted as an output of an intermediate good uh, for use by the household sector in their production of human capital assets. And to square off the accounts, because these aren't um, physically purchased transactions within the, the real world, we have to incorporate a current transfer to the household uh, to facilitate, facilitate the rerouting. So this then constrains all the changes of including human capital assets within the current and capital accounts of the sequence of accounts. Right, how to capture human capital investment from the start of education. As mentioned, our current um, income-based approach starts it's cal it starts counting at age 16 when they enter the world. So this is seen as for the sequence of accounts basis to tie up with the cost-based approach, which has education starting from the start of education, which is in the UK. Um, the September after they after a child turns four, we have to as a next step in, uh, start expanding our income based approach to cover from when the education starts, so that the two the cost based approach and the income based approach align. Uh, and in terms of recording. We've got a human capital asset being produced within the household sector, and we treat that as output for own consumption in the household sector. For the simplifying reason, this allows us for recording of human capital assets as GFCF as it is produced uh, and formed. So we don't have to worry about having to count for things like work in progress within the sequence of accounts. As soon as it's produced, our view is that because it's for our own consumption within the household sector, we can count that output as GFCF. We're now looking um, at um, the, the more tricky element of uh, are we looking in the by having human capital assets, are we looking at having to distinguish between what is a labor input and what is a human capital asset input. Because we need to do this so that the return to human capital asset, like all other, other assets, needs to be recorded as net operating surplus. And we also need to think that both the human capital income based approach and labor, um, the current um, labor input their returns there are, are um, both using labor costs as their basis of evaluation. So we need to be careful that we don't count those labor costs twice within the sequence of, of account, once as a labor input return and once as a return to a human capital asset. And it opens up the question, within modern economies, are we dealing mainly with a labour input, a return shown in, in compensation of employees, or a human capital input, where the return is shown in net operating surplus within our, our production functions? Within the discussion paper, we took the extreme view while recognising that the actual value could be a split 
between the two needs to be made. We took the extreme view of that all is going to be human capital as a input and all the return will go to net operating surplus. But the, this opens up a hopefully a good discussion of how do we draw the boundary between labour input and human capital input when we're using labour costs to evaluate both. Um, right, the next link to, to, to this is human capital assets are seen to be economically owned by households because they're embodied in people, yet the majority of the time they're used by other institutional sectors to produce goods and services. And this, so this opens up the question of how do we represent this on a transactional basis? And again, we look to the, the system of national accounts um, asset rules. On So we're treating human capital the same as any other assets. And naturally enough, if we've got an asset owned by a, a one institutional sector, but used without a change of economic ownership, we would naturally jump to the conclusion, oh, it's an operating lease. So within the discussion paper, we try to solve our human capital in the same way as any other asset and say, are we looking at here by having human capital, are we now entering into a contractual basis with employers on the same sort of um, basis as an operating lease uh, for any other asset? So in essence, households enter into a contract with an employer as a lease of their human capital, because the, the household within the terms of the contract can withdraw their human capital and reapply it to another employer within a notice period or what, whatever the contract um, defines it as. So are we actually looking now at having human capital assets and a rental payment between employers and the household for that human capital? And it's on that basis that we continue our sequencing of accounts within the discussion paper. Uh, so those were the kind of conceptual points and questions we faced ourselves with and how we solved them within this discussion paper. And that leads naturally enough on to looking at some of the um, experimental estimates and changes to the aggregates within the sequence of accounts by doing so. Right, and the data we, we used is from, as I said at, at the start, we're using the ONS's human capital estimates while recognizing some of its shortfalls for putting it into a sequence of accounts, because as we start to bring it together, we naturally need to develop that to meet the cost side of the production of human capital. And we present it in a way that meets the needs of the human capital satellite account. Uh, so within this, we recognize there are some conceptual weaknesses in the current data, which future research would look to address. And there's a, we'll get on to towards the end of the presentation about further work. Uh, and this is the first uh, UK presentation of a human capital satellite account, and its aim is to illustrate the magnitude of the impacts human capital assets could have in the economic accounts, while recognising further work and refinements could change those impacts. So within the data, uh, the main aggregates we, we looked at, so you've got gross value added, gross operating surplus, uh, changes in net worth, and you can see that for GVA, including human capital assets within our current estimates, I had a, a, a increased it by 20%. And when it comes down to changes in net worth, we're starting to see even bigger changes of almost a doubling of the uh, of, of what's there. And then we just 
got some graphs, so comparison of nominal gross value at added growth. So we see by including human capital assets, the recession which we had uh, for the financial crisis gets a lot deeper. And also in the later years, while the nominal current nominal gross value added growth was positive, we would actually have a little um, recession if we include human capital there. A lot of this kind of extreme variability is down to the fact that we haven't yet isolated and removed uh, revaluations from our estimates of human capital. So this is why we're showing it on a nominal basis. And to show kind of the impact on net worth per, per capita, the bottom line is the current estimates of UK net worth per capita. And then it, given this, the magnitude of our human capital assets, you get the upper line. And it's again reinforces that human capital assets are, are really big and they have bigger impacts on the sequence of accounts. So human capital assets, as I keep reiterating, are very large assets. They dwarf the non-financial asset stock of the U UK. Uh, based on current human capital assets, are approximately double the size of the total of all other non-financial assets within the UK. Inclusion of human capital assets has a large impact on other main economic aggregates. Uh, but this is not the end of the road for this. This started, as I said, as, as a thought experiment of how far can we push in treating human capital as a, a non-financial asset. So further work is needed to capture the buildup of human capital from the start of the education process so that the cost-based approach and our income-based approach are lined up. We need to identify the transaction, isolate the transactions, the revaluations and other volume changes because within the discussion paper, when it comes to immigration and emigration, because people move countries, um, we, would, we, we were seeing that as a, a reclassification event, so a balance sheet movement. And then at the moment, our data, oh, I, I, I'm not sure any country could theoretically get the human capital uh, reclassified nicely when looking at it in that perspective of when a person moves country we, we're either declassifying it from a domestic economy or reclassifying it into the domestic economy and that opens up the whole territorial and residency rules within this, this um, system of national accounts uh, we need to look at refining the boundary between labor inputs and human capital asset inputs. And one thing that has been raised is, do we need to think about an inclusion of an opportunity cost of work experience as an input to the production of human capital? And if we did, do we have to think about quality adjusted work experience? Because not all work experience is, can be seen as being equal. And that's a quick run through of the main points and the main data which have been generated within the discussion paper. And if anybody would like to um, contact me about this discussion paper at a later stage, my email address is there. And uh, I open myself up for discussion and comments on what's gone before. Thank you. Thank you very much for very interesting uh, presentation. So we have some time for participants to ask any questions right now, or if you want, you can write in the chat as well. You can raise your hand or Yusuf? Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, 
uh, Robert, for that uh, presentation. Honestly, it's very interesting. Uh, just here we have maybe some comments about, uh, as you know, the difficulty to get this, uh, uh, the data for the services more than products itself. So maybe if we can get it from household, uh, there is also another way, or I don't know where we can get it or catch up the, the data about the uh, volunteer, for example, and informal sectors. As you know, some in some country, there is some human work in somewhere in informal uh, sectors. So I think the, if we talk about the services as well as uh, from, for the informal and uh, volunteer or others sectors. Uh, other point about the, what about maybe if we want to include that that's in the GDP calculation, maybe now we have a way to get the GDP based on the expenditure way. So maybe this also how we can catch the expand of these products and uh, how we can include it. Maybe we need some technical more in this area. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, uh, yeah, some interesting points. Uh, yeah, we do recognize about, well, we know about the informal sector, but as, as I said, it's just the start of the journey and some of these points need further looking and we would like to explore Ban things out to include people who are employing their human capital voluntarily and even after the point of retirement, kind of if they're still active producing something in the informal sectors. We have a question uh, in the chat from Hadi Susanto. Maybe you want to ask the question? Hadi? Yes, I think it's clear that, uh, uh, thank you very much. It's a real case in Indonesia that uh, we have a, a large population and it means that uh, we also have a large numbers of employees. So most of the uh, uh, upgrading of skill uh, in Indonesia is done informally, not in the formal uh, institution. So it means that uh, the uh, input approach uh, as the approach to calculate the uh, human capital uh, cannot be done easily. We have to estimate uh, from the uh, other thing, I think. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, to have the uh, correct uh, way to estimate the uh, input uh, of the uh, upgrading of the skill upgrading. Yeah, if uh, we don't have uh, uh, if we, we don't have the data about that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, that's again, that's a very good good point about uh, as we vary across countries, some will have to look at how we capture that education and training. If it's done um, informally, then yes, some sort of estimation or on a time base might have to be made. And yeah, and some of our training is done as as in, in the comments uh, using YouTube or other internet based things. So expansions are out from the formal education training is something that we're thinking about how to measure. Thank you. We have uh, Andre and also uh, Rachel. I think Andre was first. Actually, I'm third according to my list. Uh, Rachel <laughs> and Eva were okay. So I'll, I'll okay, please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, look, thank you for that really interesting um, work and presentation, Robert. One question I had was, since you've released your experimental paper, 
Um, what has been the interest from your users in the policy uh, community um, to this work? Where do they see the opportunities perhaps? All right. Since it's uh, discussion plan has been released, um, I haven't done any had any direct contact with policy people. Um, but some of the presentations I've given within the UK, I've had people from Treasury and Bank of England there, and they've shown interest, but also recognising that at the moment we've kind of taken a few first steps, and while the interest is there, they're again. The same sort of cautious we are trying to put policy bases on, onto this at this point in time. Yeah. Oh, can you can you hear me? Yes. I, okay, good. I I still don't see me, but that's fine. Um, I I thank you, Robert, for this presentation. I think it's um, uh, it's it's an eye opener and I think an important sort of development uh, of thinking about um, um, labour as, as being a human capital, which seems to be a natural sort of step that we have to think in. Now, uh, I, I'm in a similar sort of place where Rachel, I think, is coming from. How, how does this impact, you know, our normal sort of discourse about understanding? labor you know in terms of unemployment wage rates and 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 all that you know so there's a you know a, a present discourse you know well understood in in policy terms so how would you classify an you know an underutilization of human capital is that un, un unemployed how how does that terminology start to link up uh, with using the term human capital versus labor inputs maybe uh, if you don't have immediate answer, I think these these things are important when we have our dialogues with the uh, uh, policy uh, groups about how we're going to use this terminology or a blend of terminology so that we can help them understand that in policy making. Just maybe some initial thoughts from your side will be helpful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's very, as you said, we've grown up understanding labour and unemployment and which is why I called it within the paper a kind of this paradigm shift to start to recognize that it is a different way of thinking about it. And yes, we're going to have to start thinking about underutilized assets more or assets uh, um, or people making decisions that mean that they're actually receiving um, kind of a wage, uh, wage and signing, or as I called it, rental payments from their employer through choice which is below what the market would put it as given their years of education or training so yeah i haven't got any final answers on on this but it is where it's useful discussions to be starting to have of if we did treat it as an asset in a strict sense what type of terms and discussions do we have to use but I, yeah. i'm open to to thinking a bit more about that and uh, entering discussions with people if they were in that space as well. Great, thank you. Okay. Andrew, then after this, I think uh, we will just go to the next item, yeah? After Andrew. Okay, great. Um, well, well, thank you. Um, I should have went first because Rachel stole my question. Um, I, I did I did want to ask about sort of um, the, um, the, the take up you've had from, from researchers and, and policymakers. Uh, to this work, and, uh, and and if there was any traction in terms of getting things to think about um, how to use um, those statistics in, in, in policy making. And I guess I'll turn that around and, and just sort of go back to um, what are the next steps at the ONS now regarding this work? I presume you're going to continue. I mean, your, your presentation certainly touches on uh, global research that needs to happen, but if you could expand a little bit on what are your, your next steps, I would be very thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I, uh, it's not the end of the road. It's part of the ONS's inclusive income work stream. And uh, I think Richard's going to be talking about that later on in this meeting. Uh, so Richard Hayes uh, is going to be on, on that. So it's part of the, the inclusive income work. Uh, we are continuing to look at um, developing it. We need to 
get to align the two, the cost-based and the income-based flows need to be aligned as a first step. We need to break down the income-based into transactions, revaluations, and um, other volume changes to really get to the same position as other assets. So those are the immediate kind of first steps. Um, further down the line is, is looking at how to expand that cost-based approach to, income, to capture things which are informal and not uh, necessarily market-based in terms of education and training. Also trying to get an estimates of in-house training as well for corporations and other institutional sectors as the immediate first steps. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, many participants have a lot of questions still, uh, and we can reach out to Dr. Robert uh, in the days to come. Yeah. Yeah, I'm more than welcome to enter discussions <laughs> with yeah. anybody who wants to yeah. debate these tricky um, conceptual points. Thank you so much. It was really interesting. Personally, I have also some questions, but I'll get back. Uh, ask you separately now okay. we have uh, we have a session four it's also it's on the follow-up work from the report on the 54th session of the statistical commission so first uh, we have uh, one presentation on the data access print uh, phase one that has been completed and it will be presented uh, uh, by miss leon uh, and uh, joint task team on uh, from the global facilita facilitation of access to privately held data for official statistics. So it will be followed by other presentations. So I'll now give the floor to Ms. Leanne. Yes, thank, thank you. you. I quickly want to check whether you can see my slides because that was an issue last time. So, okay, good. Thanks. I see thumbs up. So that's a good sign. Um, so my name is Liana. I work at Statistics Netherlands at the methodology department, uh, and I've been supporting this work on uh, privately held data. Uh, and I want to quickly run through the things that we have done so far and also look ahead in, in the work plan that we're um wanting to discuss with you and, and, and see and hear your feedback about. So first, let me see what it is. Yes, so the joint task team on global facilitation of access to private GL data is a collaboration between both the, the network so, um, of economic statisticians, but also with the UN Committee of Experts on uh, Big Data and Data Science for Official Statistics. So last year, Um, where we discussed and dived into global value chains um, and also regarding um, how can we uh, access data, what are the principles regarding uh, collaborating with uh, the private sector. Um, we also had some, uh, some parties from the private sector who wanted to discuss with us how they look at the official statistics community, um, and in the last session, we um, we have been discussing um, ways to work towards a community of practice, and we've had some use cases. So quickly to skip to session four, um, we discussed that we wanted to have the work aligned along four pillars. So both the user needs, and I think that was already mentioned earlier in the session. So what what can our users uh, if, if we have access to privately held data, how is this useful for both the uh, statistics officers, but also for um, those that are working with our statistics? So what are the benefits there to develop and extend uh, liaise with the principles that are already existing uh, regarding the collaboration with uh, the private sector? Methods to work with these data, because those are not the the usual structured data that we get from companies. So how do you work with uh, privately held data that is completely different from what we uh, commonly are used to uh, working with and also to extend uh, the capacity building. So work, uh, work with others. Um, what we've learned from these five use cases so far is um, well, initially, we noticed that a lot of the private sector companies, they were very eager to uh, enter into the 
conversation with us. Uh, they were very curious about what we wanted and also what, um, well, what could be in, in it for them. But we also noticed that while there was an eagerness to start a conversation, it has been more tricky to have the conversation ongoing and to see what's in it for both parties. So how to, to um, make that relationship uh, stronger and also to see uh, what we could do um, in the collaboration has been a little bit more difficult. Um, and also it takes a lot of time to build up the relationship, to build the trust um, that we're not out there to uh, collect all the data, but uh, that we are looking for ways to, to really to collaborate and to find things that are useful for us, but especially also what, what's useful for, uh, for businesses. So to see how we can enter in this win-win situation has been, uh, has been difficult and, and it takes a lot of time to, uh, to set up that relationship. We noticed that the resources are rather limited. Um, talking about uh, human capital, <laughs> there, there's a lot of human capital involved uh, in this project. So this is not certainly not work that I did by myself. Uh, there has been a, a large team working on this and we noticed that, that things move slowly uh, because people have lack of time. Uh, so that, that has been difficult. And I think last but not least, um, we noticed that the, the global value chains that we had had the, the sprints about has proven to be a tricky question, both for NSIs, but also for companies, because it's it's not very tangible. It's, it's quite difficult to really see what can we do with it, um, which additional information does it provide us, and also what should or could companies provide. Uh, to really answer these questions. So we've noticed that that there has been some struggle there. And that also means the last point that there has no been no, no standard procedure to, uh, to move forward. So then how are we going to move forward? Uh, as already mentioned, so this was the, basically phase first, the first phase that we, where we uh, took some lessons from. So now we want to move, uh, instead of with five use cases, work with two work streams, uh, one uh, being the tourism and the other being e-commerce, and really seek the collaboration with, uh, with other stakeholders that could, for instance, so uh, the network is obviously uh, one of these stakeholders, but also uh, different departments from the UN, uh, Eurostat, IMF, well, I can <laughs> basically name all the international organizations that are already on the website. Um, so really liaise and collaborate with these stakeholders to see how we can move this work forward. Um, and, and know uh, that we have to take it one step at a time uh, because big plans, they, uh, they, they run dead <laughs> very quick, quickly. So we really need to take a small step at a time and, um, and learn on the fly to see what, how we can uh, move forward. So we can't do this by ourselves. So please, uh, if you're uh, interested in either tourism or uh, e-commerce, or if you're willing to uh, invest in, for instance, uh, extending the work along these four pillars that I uh, already meant, please leave your email address or find my email address uh, on the presentation because we're actively looking for uh, people to help us uh, to move this work forward and really to gain access to privately held data. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leanne. So, from the Maldives side, I remember we, we are yet to discuss uh, this after the expression of interest. So, I think we will take the questions and discussion uh, at the end. So, let's go for the uh, next presentation on Beyond GDP Spring 2023 uh, by Richard. Hello. My slides, thank you. Yes, we can. Excellent, good. So, uh, Richard, can you please move closer to the mic? Thanks. Yeah. There you go. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> right, so the Beyond GDP sprints, um, we hosted a series last year. We're going to be, uh, we are into holding our second set of sessions this year. I'm going to give a little bit more detail on times and dates and speakers at the end, but just to sort of summarize 
where we have been. Um, I think we're, we're very aware that we are in a world where we have a growing and increasing range of users, all of whom have different needs, not just your, your traditional economic central bank finance ministry perspective. Um, we know people are using GDP in places where it's not always the best product to be used. And, and we can see real, real momentum uh, from the UN and, and other organisations who are asking questions around producing complements to GDP and the other traditional economic measures. And we can also see a huge amount of activity. Um, the SNA process, which is ongoing, the SEA process, which looks at environmental assets, which has been uh, recently reported. All of this takes us to a position to to look again at, at the potential and the opportunity and to see what we can do to move forward. We're also very well aware that there are a lot of countries who have developed dashboards and indicators um, to suit their domestic need. And actually one of the things we do need to do is look at how we we bring all of that knowledge together and, and find ways to produce internationally comparable data. Um, one of the really interesting things that I think we found through the sprints is that when we say beyond GDP, um, that beyond bit very definitely means different things to different people. It can mean just moving beyond national accounts. It can mean moving beyond economic statistics. It can mean moving well beyond statistics. Um, and, and actually, as we've tried to throw the net quite wide, um, the little quote at the bottom there that I like using, um, the interesting thing about the sprints is realising I am part of what you call beyond GDP. I didn't see the connection before. I think is really, really important because, as Stefan mentioned, forging links and bringing different perspectives together has been a key part of what we're trying to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the perspectives that we put to the UN Statistical Commission. Um, and it's worth saying when we get there, we are trying to complement our work with the social friends of the chair group who are going to take some strands forward whilst we work on on some others. Um, following on from Rob's discussion um, and, and the questions around how we've engaged with, with users, um, I wanted to just throw this, this up here. I mean, th this is a colour photo of London in 1948, hard to believe, um, uh, when the, the SNA was being created. And the focus very much was on flows. It was on flows because there really wasn't a lot of capital. Um, many buildings had been destroyed during the struggles of the war. Um, natural capital was in a very bad place. London was famed for smogs. People died regularly um, from poor uh, air pollution. Um, the Thames was chem declared chemically dead just a few years later, and very few people went to university. Um, large quantities of the workforce used muscles and, and low skilled labour effectively. So taking some of that data that Rob talked about earlier, um, the picture here on the, the right data on the right hand side shows that when we look across the bottom, you know, national accounts is giving us around 11 trillion pounds worth of assets around just under 2 trillion pounds worth of natural capital assets coming from our seer estimates and around 24 trillion coming from human capital um, and that feeling that if the, the the teams that were framing national accounts in 1948 were time traveled to the modern day and we're looking at these questions we think that very likely have been starting from far more of a capitals perspective rather than the flows perspective. Um, and so we've published this data on the right hand side to try and showcase the importance of looking at these and the, the importance of Rob's work to help us to understand and make sure they're actually thinking about different capital estimates on a like for like basis. Um, that's very, very important when we're trying to compare data that we are talking apples with apples. Um, and of course, if we're thinking around the capitals, we see that across the bottom here of this this picture, I hope you can see my 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 cursor, the actual methods we use to cal calculate and think about assets are drawn from a wide range of statistical domains. 
which work very hard to align with each other and to ensure consistency, but that is um, difficult. And I think Rob's work uh, has shown, as well as efforts to bring together natural capital and, and, and other forms of data, the methods that we use to value things and to do the calculations are, are really important here. And so I think, uh, particularly in the UK, just to answer the specific question from before, as we engage with users, it's trying to make sure we're giving them something that they can tell an intelligent story from and they see that we're on a journey with them to, to improve these and to make data available, which helps them to tackle some of the bigger questions. Um, the other key thing that the sprints last year discovered um, was that there's a wide range of activity. I don't think there's been any lack of trying. Um, we see a, a very large spread of different uh, products which have been developed by a wide range of organisations. But when we're talking and engaging with users, one of the things they're finding really difficult is to know which product to use for which question. Um, and so one of um, our task team, Rutger Huckstra uh, from the University of Leiden, has been working on bringing together a website um, which tries to categorise and group many of these products and to explain which parts of the beyond gdp landscape they particularly address i'll put the link in the sidebar in a minute once i finish talking but that is a a really nice product starting to mature it's still very much at early days um, but i think the more we can do to help our users navigate the beyond gdp system the easier we will find to to make that link to their needs and to to bring them with us on that journey um, the other key thing that we uh, identified in the sprints was just the depth of history of beyond GDP work. It didn't start with Stiglitz, Sen and Fatusi in 2010. It didn't even particularly start with the Brundtland Report in 1987. There, there's clearly a long heritage of work which has been undertaken in this space. I'm not going to take through uh, you through everything on this slide in great detail we don't have the time but just to say that we very much are looking to reuse and recycle as much of material that we can starting from scratch doesn't make much sense particularly when early attempts may not have fully succeeded but they often served as the framework within which different areas began to tackle generating statistics and thinking about their conceptual framework and actually we find that particularly from the work between 1968 and 1974, an awful lot of data that currently operates across the, the statistical system often has its, its roots in its methods and concepts in very closely related areas of work which were designed to be consistent. We think that's a real benefit that we can, we can use and leverage. Um, particularly in 1974, we see a report that talks about how you bring together um, social statistics in uh, a coherent fashion. And this is an area um, where, as work didn't fully mature, the SNA in 1993 and 2008 began to colonise and began to produce additional information to help to form some of the bridge. Um, and so, Working with our social friends of the chairs, colleagues, we've begin, begun to interrogate these areas um, and we're going to continue to do that through the sprints um, to explore um, to what depth further work is needed or actually the problems were computational or data and where the world has changed and evolved. This isn't 1974 anymore. Um, and particularly as uh, Leanne and her sprint start to think about new data sources, how far can we go into addressing some of these um, in that conceptually consistent way? Although there is the need to consider that the world has also changed in terms of the concepts since 1974. Um, areas around rights, identity, the environment, governance, there, there are a range of topics which we may need to think about in a slightly different way. Um, bring into this framework. So for the prospectus, our, our proposal was essentially um, that if one wanted to bring together a central framework to help you measure inclusive and sustainable well-being and think about beyond GDP, 
you needed to use the system of national accounts and the SEER as foundational bases that allowed you to draw data from those, but you needed to look back at that work on the social side to give you the same um, solidity, the same foundation um, on the social and population side. And so the social friends of the chair are really tackling the top orange box in this diagram. Um, whilst in parallel, our sprints are going to be increasingly focused on that central um, box, that central bubble in this framework, thinking about how we help uh, and understand the dashboards that people have developed around the world, the different metrics that they've used, where they're drawing their data from, um, and where there would be advantages or the potential to develop new measures which fill gaps within this landscape as we bring these systems and manuals together. Um, one of the things that I know I'm currently exploring in this space is um, we see a lot of academic work around subjective well-being, how people feel, um, quality of life, life satisfaction. It's often presented in slightly different ways, but is um, a an attempt to measure how good life is from the perspective of the individual. And this is obviously affected by a wide range of um, levers and drivers, whether they are personal, um, family relationships, these types of things, um, circumstance uh, and luck. Um, the weather um, unsurprisingly plays a, a quite big, uh, has quite a big impact on personal life satisfaction, but also policy drivers. Um, those things that governments can um, intervene and support and drive, particularly in those domains of economy, environment and society and the trade-offs between the three and thinking about how we um, bring this together into a framework which allows us to capture particularly the impact of those policy drivers, which is where we get to um, leverage over policy and understand really the trade-offs between different policy levers in these fields allows us to consider how best to begin to shape and structure some of um, that central framework. Obviously, you need to be able to do that in a way which thinks about inclusivity, so looks at distributions, thinks about sustainability, so captures a capital perspective, but very much relies, as I say, on those core, those three core frameworks and the data you can draw from them. Uh, I'm going to speed up very quickly just to give you sight of this sheet. Um, uh, as um, Stefan said, we had over 200 attendees at the first sprint session. We've had just under 500 people register for the sprint series over the next um, couple of months. We're going to we're running free sprints this month in June. Then we're going to have a short summer break, which will also allow us to review the, 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 the work from those first three. Come back in September, uh, hold three more and then hold a wash up sprint where people will report back on the progress from the particular sessions. So the first session focused on uh, that joint work with the social friends of the chair to explore a system of population and social statistics. Um, later this week, we are going to pick up on that central framework, that beyond GDP and well-being work. In session three, we're going to particularly look at ESG, so business data about economy and the society, and how we could leverage and use that. So that's a, that's an entirely new question that we've been posed. We often think about household data, we think about um, other sources, but business data has often been sort of consigned to just the economy question. But businesses are thinking in, in the environment and social space as well. And we think this is now the time to start to think about if business uh, accountants are, beginning, are collecting data in this field, what can we do with it? Sprint session four, which will take us into September, we'll look at the variety of countries who are generating dashboards, and sets of indicators of their own and often underneath the SDGs and looking at whether there are common components which many countries use uh, and where they vary. Uh, session five uh, will look at distributional frameworks, whether to use the individual or the household as a unit of currency. Um, question, session six will take us to 
a difficult question around composite indices and how to do those in a way uh, which are conceptually meaningful um, but simple enough to be used by by policymakers. We know things like GDP. One of its great ben, great strengths is it, it's very simple to understand. Uh, and seven, we will report back to the community uh, in on October the fifth. Any questions? I'll pause there. Sorry if I ran over my time, Shahuda. So much. Uh... It was so interesting that uh, I don't think uh, we felt the time was passing. It was very fast. Sorry. Yes, but I think we have uh, we are right on time still. So shall we go for the uh, uh, next presentation? And then it's on the international classification sprint, and it will be presented by Miss Ilaria uh, from the business statistics section of the UNSD. Thank you, Shao. Shao. Oh, that, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, before I start, maybe let me say my name is Ilaria Di Matteo and I work in UNSD. I'm responsible for the program on uh, business statistics and classification. But I'm presenting today on behalf of the Bureau of the Committee of Experts on uh, International Statistical Classification. And this uh, presentation, um, as it was mentioned at the beginning, is a little bit a follow up to a discussion that took place at the side event uh, of the network during the Statistical Commission in March, but also to the discussion of the during the Statistical Commission. Um, and very much it arrives at a very um, at a very good point in time um, as the Committee on uh, Classification of Expert on Classification is actually um, there is an ongoing discussion on uh, how to make classification more uh, relevant and uh, the revision processes more uh, agile. As you might know, we are just uh, we just finished with the revision of ISIC, uh, and uh, the the previous version of ISIC was from 2006, and we had started the revision of ISIC um, a couple of years ago. So we had a long list of issues to address, and it was a very intense uh, revision process. In the meantime, we have started also re the revision of other classification, the classification of product, the classification of energy product. Uh, we will start with the classification of uh, the function of the government. So this whole work um, a little bit um, was the input for a reflection from by the committee. Uh, on how to make this work uh, more um, more integrated, more efficient, but also came with the realization that classification, although fundamental for the statistical infrastructure, uh, they are not often very uh, recognized by the user or within the office. Excuse um, me, Miss Ilaria, are you moving the slide? So yes, now. So okay, as a uh, no worries, no worries. So uh, since February, since March, February uh, this year, we had a several uh, of coordination meeting with the network and the Bureau of the uh, Classification, uh, the Committee on Classification. And we developed a concept note. We identified topics and dates for the sprint. Um, and so the presentation here is on uh, where we are at the moment with the organization of the sprint. So first of all, uh, the sprint are intended to be jointly organized by the Committee on uh, Classification of Experts on Classification and the Network of Economic Statisticians. And the main uh, objectives for this uh, sprint is from the one side to raise awareness on the importance of uh, classification not only within the internal users in the statistical office, but also with external users. Uh, advance the outreach by the committee to um, engage more the broader community outside the classification expert. And also uh, we see this print very much as an additional forum, forum for discussing and sharing modern ways for updating and implementing classification. And overall, 
uh, the main objective is to highlight the importance of investing in the classification work as a foundation for data integration. So we identified uh, three sprint, um, three sorry, three webinar within the sprint. The first webinar is on the statistical classification as a foundation for data integration. And during this seminar, we really want to make the case of the importance of uh, classification uh, for data integration. There are uh, within the statistical production process of a, a, a then so. Um, the second webinar, webinar will be on the mechanism for rendering the classification process more efficient through collaboration and coordination. And this uh, seminar will uh, fit very much into the discussion of the uh, Committee of Experts on Classification on the revision cycle of uh, classification and also mechanism to coordinate this revision cycle at global level, regional level and national level. This to ensure that uh, when we revise a classification, we um, take into account um, all the different, uh, all the classification that are uh, um, that needs to be coordinated at global, regional, and national level. Uh, we also, the committee also is um, has proposed to the statistical commission, for example, a regular revision cycle for uh, the classification of economic activity and the classification of product, and is formulating a proposal for the statistical commission uh, to be uh, presented in uh, March 2024. So we see the second semi uh, webinar very much as a uh, user consultation or a, a consultation uh, outside the committee on the proposal for this um, <clears throat> regular revision cycle and uh, um, the creation of standing groups for the maintenance of ISIC and CPC. And then the third seminar will be on the role of technology in the classification work. So there is a lot of, um, I mean, the technology has advanced enormously and uh, classification hasn't uh, fully taken advantage of the, these advances. We have very good example from uh, New Zealand, Statistics Canada, uh, also FAO developed uh, linked data, uh, linked open data system to manage classification, to uh, link classification. And there is a discussion on how to make it more uh, prevalent within uh, uh, statistical offices, but also the work at the global regional uh, level. And also this uh, final seminar will be, uh, we want to draw the conclusion for the, for the whole sprint. And um, we want to see the input that uh, can be taken up for the, uh, from the Committee on Classification for uh, the report to the Statistical Commission. Uh, now, if we look at the date, we, oh, before the dates, uh, the target audience, as we uh, said before, uh, the idea is to open up as much as possible uh, this discussion outside the classification experts. So, of course, the, the network of economic statistician as organizer, we would hope that you are all engaged in these uh, webinars. Uh, but also we want to extend to uh, specific expert groups, committee uh, under the statistical commission, users outside the um, statistical world, uh, and were relevant also administrative uh, users of the classification to elaborate a little bit more on uh, um, the use of this classification, not only for statistical purposes, but also for administrative purposes. The date um, have been identified and they are here on the screen. Maybe just to mention that the first date uh, was chosen during the meeting of the Committee of Experts on uh, Classification, which take place during the week of the 21 of October. And the idea is to um, bring the, the whole committee on uh, classification into the webinars and uh, also update uh, the fact that is during the, the meeting, 
we will be able to bring back uh, some of the discussion from the meeting on classification. And the rest of the um, uh, meeting are intended to go up until January so that we can complete the sprint prior to the statistical commission. I think this is uh, all from my side. Uh, of course, we would welcome uh, any additional input, any comment, and uh, if any of you is uh, interested in participating, in sharing your experience uh, in your office on uh, uh, the role of classification, um, uh, we would very welcome um, uh, your proposal, your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ilaria. So now I would like to open the floor for discussion on the, the three presentations because we want uh, feedback and involvement of the participants as much as possible. So if there are any questions or any comments, like you can raise your hand or you can even write in the chat. Anybody wants to go first? Yusuf? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for those three presentations. Uh, just I will have a question for Lina, I think, that's regarding the, uh, the organization or the, the cooperation between the private sector and the uh, statistic office. Uh, honestly, or actually, here in my country, Oman, we have that statistical information law, which organize uh, the 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 shared data between the national statistic and uh, whereas for the governments or for the private sectors uh, of course we we deal with the private sector by quarterly or monthly and there uh, may be some time in some survey we can go to 100 percent response that's because the statistic law it said if you don't respond for me within 10 days or 15 days there is some payment you have to do it and of course but that's before that, yes, we have good communication with them. And also we have in between, for example, we offer the private sector training. Uh, and also we ask him what they requested for the data, what they needed, of course. But also uh, we deal with them by, let's say, by software and also by the law. This is also, it's keep us and also this help us when we start uh, change our methodology from the field work to database link. So we feel that's by the law, it's organized everything now. We could uh, manage our, our survey or our data flow, let's say, not survey now. We don't do a survey a lot in the field now. And uh, I think also, think that's one question, and also the second question about beyond the GDP. Uh, here, sometime we can see uh, the requested or the use for GDP, they mentioned the slides. Uh, of course, not only the for the uh, it's the show what the size of economic of the country, but also, of course, there is there is some policies. It depends by that. Uh, I think also we have to have a new methodology how the country utilize all this hard work to get it by the end with the GDP. But behind that also, there's a lot of information we need to, uh, to start to use it. And for the classification, I think uh, here in the country, in my country, uh, the NCSI or the National Center, he's the owner of this. If any new classification, let's say for Quilcob or Isaac, or nowadays for the for education or for labor, all these approved from the NCSI, then through the cabinet, we 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 send this for all the unit in the country. They have to also to use it in order to be shared. When they are going to later on to share it, all the data database it has to work in the same version of this uh, classification. This is from our side. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we will take a few more questions uh, and then maybe 
there are common issues as well. Would any other participant want to be part of the discussion? I don't see any hands. <laughs> so how about the, we have three uh, questions here. So from Yusuf. Leanne. Yes, so uh, thank you, Yusuf, for your uh, for your comments and your question. Um, so in the Netherlands, we also have uh, a similar statistics law that that sort of um, well enforces uh, us uh, to collect data from from companies. And and as you mentioned, that's usually done uh, using surveys. Um, however, in the privately held data. Um, we work stream, we will also want to look into other kinds of data that they aren't necessarily obliged to deliver to uh, our statistical office. So see if if using other kinds of data, we can also produce new kinds of statistical products uh, that are not that are not part of our current um, work program at the moment. So we're also looking into uh, non-financial data, for instance, um, Global value chain was a uh, example, but obviously there there are multiple topics that you could uh, investigate and publish about um, with and and you need data other data than the the typical survey data uh, that we're already getting. So I hope that answers your question. For Richard. I think yep. there's one question. Yeah. Apologies, there might be some, <laughs> some noise in my background, but I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, I think Yusuf raises a couple of really, really important points. The first is um, we're always going to need some sort of GDP type metric. Um, I view it a bit like the beyond GDP tells you what we need to be working on and, and the key trade offs between policies. But GDP in many ways sets the, the budget um that, that countries have the you know the tax base that it can then deploy to think about those policy decisions um and if you're going and if you're in that position that you're always going to need a gdp type metric then yes the question of how we reuse and recycle some of the data we collect to give us wider perspectives is something that we we're very actively thinking about the need to minimize new data requirements I think is is a key part of making beyond GDP a success because we know that countries are not going to be able to invest endless resources in achieving this. We have to find ways to do this which are um, affordable um, for multiple countries to be able to tackle and that means recycling and reusing data wherever wherever we can. Um, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you. And now to Ms. Ilaria. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf, uh, for uh, sharing the practice uh, in Oman. I think maybe this is this might be a a good um, a example to share uh, during the sprint. What are the benefit uh, of uh, having a system where uh, all the, for example, administrative sources use the classification? Uh, and so the data sharing is cert certainly facilitated, but what could be the uh, drawback or the roadblocks in this uh, scenario? So, uh, Yusuf, thank you for uh, your intervention, and maybe uh, we can be in contact uh, for the sprint where you can share more about this, uh, your situation. Thank you. Yes, uh, there were no hands at the time, if there are many points that any participant would like to raise uh, right now, or otherwise we can go to the next item. And in the meantime, we can uh, use the chat as well. Okay, so I will now give the floor to our coach, yeah, Andre. Andre is going to take us through the Improving the network's communication and outreach activities, uh, the proposed process improvements. Uh, so I will uh, give the floor to Andre. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Can you hear me? Yes. And can you see my screen? Yes. Right. Um, and is it in presentation mode now? Not yet. Okay, uh, yes. okay no, great. Good. So, um, maybe I'll just skip to the next slide. So the, the network is, is relatively new. Um, we've been sort of in operation for, for almost two years. Um, and last year was really sort of the, the first year where um, we, we had a, a lot of activities. The um, so our mode of uh, of operations was was really about um, um, organizing thematic sprints um, on, on on various uh, themes um, and really build the case for experimentation and testing, listening um, to, to to recommendations for improving comparability for data quality and, and so on. And who did we want to target with respect to these thematic sprints? Well, it was um, it was obviously the uh, everybody that participates in the statistical ecosystem. So academia, private sector, of course, national statistics uh, institutions, but also international organizations such as the UN and the ACB and, and so on. Um, we did as well organize a few side events um, on the margins of the other um, conferences where they do where there's a lot of attendance from national statistical organizations. Uh, for example, we organized a side event uh, around the statistical commission last year. Um, we also organized a uh, uh, an informal meeting of the network um, in Brussels uh, when we had sort of the, the, the conference on uh, um, on the, the next steps with, with respect to economic statistics and the NDG. Um we uh, are consulting with various uh, regional re uh, representatives, um, and, 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 and the focus of those consultations is really to learn about um, the various priorities of, of, of the regions, and, and really again the, this idea of, um, of of trying to facilitate collaboration, networking, and, and knowledge. So, um, um, as I said, we, we've been in operation now. We've got a, a, a full uh, year of experience under our belts. And, and what have you learned? Well, the feedback from the stakeholders is um, is one that um, we need to improve on uh, follow up and communication activities resulting from from the sprint session. Um, so we've had sprint sessions, um, and uh, certainly the, the folks that participate in, in, in the sprints uh, have thought they were useful. But we do need a mechanism to sort of communicate what we're finding uh, coming out of the sprints, um, and, uh, and and to be a little bit more transparent in, in terms of what we've done. What we've done. One of the things that, that came up um, during the side event at, at the commission. Um, there's this idea of the, the, the network acting a little bit uh, like an early warning system for the statistical system um, in the sense that, you know, it, it could sort of be used to um, um, to determine sort of what priorities are, are coming down, what are the, the critical things that um, national statistics organizations are going to need to do um, in, the, in the future. Um, Another thing that we heard from stakeholders is, um, you know, and I've heard that personally from, from, from many, um, and I think my colleagues as well, um, is that people do want to participate. We're, we're being asked all the time about, Ooh, how can I connect to, to, to the network? How can I participate in this and so on? So there's a real um, desire, I think, to be part of, of, of this work. Um, we have a small bureau that, that, that manages the activities of the network. And um, and we meet quite frequently and, uh, and, and and discuss these issues. And one of the things that, that we discussed um, uh, at the um, at the bureau is is the the idea that um, we do need to think about the process for gathering uh, input. Um, and uh, part of sort of the, the you know what we've seen today is, is part of that. But, but we do need to do a better job at sort of collecting the priorities from the member participants. We need better mechanisms to generate interest and in, in, in member participation. Um, and, and we also need um, 
Okay, and this is key. Uh, we also need uh, partners uh, to uh, to co-invest and and and, and, uh, and work on network activities and and outcomes. Uh, what we're finding is that uh, as a small bureau, um, a lot of the activities that are coming from uh, the network are being driven by the bureau members and our capacity is limited. So the more we can get people to participate and actually co-lead and co-invest in some of this work. Uh, the better off the, the members would be. So moving forward, um, we do want to address, uh, address the gaps that I just talked about. So one, we want to improve the relevance of our program, and we want to do so, um, one, by establishing a more formal and structured consultation process um, with sort of the, the network members, but also um, all the statistical groups and, and committees in, in the statistical ecosystem. So we, we want to consult on, on topics and areas of focus. Uh, we want to use regular network meetings, such as this one, um, to request formal input and expression of interest in participating in, in the work. And we also want to establish a formal process for canvassing um, the regional commissions, the directors of the, the, the statistics divisions in the regional commissions. We want to consult with global and regional expert committees and statistical groups uh, on sort of the priorities and on topics uh, and, and, and so on. Um, second, we want formal communication um, on uh, the sprint activities and the outcomes. So the, the network will communicate and, and share uh, the outcomes of each sprint. Um, this is one thing that, uh, that we're, that we're going to do. Um, you might have seen that from, uh, um, from Richard's presentation on the Beyond GDP in his last sprint. One of the last sessions was sort of the uh, uh, a wrap up of, of all of the, the very expensive so we're working that in. Um, and, and we also want to get to early input from stakeholders on the next steps um, uh, or develop documents um, um, that will be sought sort of as, a, as a result of, of the space. We really want to get the opinions of the group. Um, next, we're going to change uh, the, uh, the, we're going to expand the, the activities that, that we do. And so today um, we are having uh, our first quarterly meeting uh, of, um, of the year. But we, we do want to establish a schedule of quarterly meetings. Um, so that, um, that includes uh, meetings uh, with you and other participants. We've sort of um, included, as you saw from, uh, um, from, from the presentation today, that, that we are going to bring in uh, keynote speakers. To make sure that, that if people aren't available, uh, they can always see the, the, the sprint meetings. We are recording them now, and we will post them on the network website uh, so that you can consult as well. And uh, and ideally, we'd like to organize at least one face-to-face -face meeting um, following a preceding uh, a well-attended uh, large statistical meeting. So again, this year we uh, we had a side event at, at the statistical commission. Uh, very uh, very good event. Uh, very well attended. So we'd like to do more of those, and uh, we're, uh, we're looking for options for doing that. Um, we're also looking um, at um, producing short and, and focused podcasts on, on relevant themes. Um, and, and here, the, uh, the the key point is that we are looking for volunteers who may want to take the lead, and, and rather than sort of organizing a meeting on a specific session. I, I, I a specific topic. I, I think uh, an interesting way to do that would be to, uh, to record a podcast or a presentation. And this can take uh, many different forms, and then we could post it on, on the website as well. So we're looking for, for partners to do that. Okay, and 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 lastly, uh, we do want to uh, strengthen relations with uh, uh, the various committees of the, the UN, the regional commissions, the expert groups, and so on. Um, in, uh, in some of the work that the, the network did um, that we presented at the Statistical Commission, uh, we did produce a synthesis report um, that, uh, that, that really looked at the, uh, all the different priorities um, of the work that was presented at the Statistical Commission in, in March. And what came out of that is that the three overwhelming themes um, data integration, regional commission like the, uh, coordination, and inter international standards. So we do want to sort of weave that into our thinking in terms of the network. And of course, we want to include uh, and improve participation of, of the global South. 
So that wraps up my presentation. Um, so I walked through some of the things that we're, we're doing to expand the communication uh, and, uh, and, and uh, access to, to the network. And uh, certainly we'd be looking for your feedback and, and comments. So if you have feedback now, we're happy to hear it. If not, uh, for sure, you can sort of send us emails and, and as we had discussed that earlier. So I'll stop sharing the screen now. And um, we can get on to the other way and make sure I can see it. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I think this is the time, uh, most important uh, time that uh, we can discuss to see how it's going, whether it is okay or whether there's immediate uh, observations or some feedback that you can share. Anybody would like to raise your hand or? So I think uh, we are close to <laughs> closing time as well. Uh, but like Henry has suggested and highlighted uh, in the bureau meetings, uh, it's really important to, to get feedback and suggestions and participation from the uh, committee uh, bureau members. Uh, f from the network members so that we can uh, try and uh, deliver on, I mean, on a better agenda on, and see how uh, we can keep up with uh, what is expected from the network. So whether what we are doing is something that is on priorities of countries. Uh, so those types of things. And I think uh, we have got a lot of uh, information on upcoming events uh, on the classification and the beyond GDP sprints. Uh, so I hope uh, committee member, network members will be uh, keeping these uh, dates and participating in these activities. Uh, uh, would any any of you say would like to say anything? Any of the yeah, Richard, please. It's just a very quick one. Um, sorry, I've got someone drilling in the background. Um, in terms of keynote speakers, um, we've started to prepare a, a list of potential speakers, but if anyone has um, any names that they would like to recommend or suggest, um, please do to put them to, to Andre or myself and we will um, we will work them into the list and try to make sure we're we're covering a wide range of, of topics um, and particularly if there are topics which people would find interesting for a keynote speaker even if you don't have a name um, we if you give us the topics we can work to find um, people who are doing interesting work uh, in that area thank you thank you so providing feedback, Andre, it's uh, from the to the website uh, uh, through the email address. They can provide the feedback. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yeah. again, directly if um, people want to okay. reach out that way as well. Yeah. Um, one point I I think maybe we can close off in the session is that uh, certainly we've um, I, I think as part of the network we focused uh, considerably on. Uh, the beyond GDP topic, um, you know, and 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 last year we didn't talk about it today because it's not really part of our, our work plan. But we did talk about the um, owner occupied housing and inflation and, and how to get those estimates in, in the CPI, and and that was quite a, an interesting um, topic that uh, garnered a lot of attention at the commission. A lot of the remarks that that, uh, that, 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 that were made on the commission floor related to the work on owner occupied housing. So where am I going with this? Is that um, our work, I think, spans um, you know, more broadly than, than just the, the, the beyond the key work. It, it's certainly there's a big focus there and there's a lot of work being done there. And it's really, really good work. But um, I think this is an opportunity as well to look at other issues pertaining to economic statistics that perhaps aren't, uh, perhaps aren't uh, as, um, 
uh, aren't, aren't aren't sort of looked at sort of uh, as frequently or aren't in the in, in the uh, in the limelight like uh, like the BMD. So certainly, if folks have other uh, considerations that they want to bring up, uh, please let us know. Thank you. So, is there anybody, Rafa, please? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that I was on mission to Bangkok uh, last week and uh, talking about Beyond GDP and the work um, ahead. Uh, we had countries saying that uh, already we have a lot of work and, uh, you know, we cannot take this on board. But I think we have to get back to what Mr. Youssef mentioned, is that the data on GDP is, we there's a lot of data that can be used. And then when we, we link it to social and environment, you know, uh, a lot can be done. So maybe this is important because the the, the Lord countries will think uh, they don't have the resources to work on this. and and they tend to drop it. Uh, so just to say that maybe, maybe we called it beyond GDP, but it can be GDP and, and beyond, and you know what it can bring uh, to the table with the, with the, this wealth of information. Uh, and just second point with, um, with the classifications and uh, data linking. So a, a lot can be done through uh, like the technological advancement, some pilot studies, how, how to link data, and we can be more practical on, on providing support to countries. Thank you, Andre and Richard. Thank you, Rosa, for that. Uh, so is there any, anything, any other observation or comment? Would anybody like to jump in? <laughs> no? Okay. So that, thing, that brings us to the uh, last, last item. So for me, for me, I would like to just uh, say a few concluding remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, we have, uh, we have had a lot of participants, like over close to 32 participants uh, joined the session. And then uh, I think it has been very informative. Uh, personally, I found it very interesting and informative. I think uh, all the information that we have got, uh, it's uh, very useful for the uh, future sessions as well. And then uh, uh, we hope that it has been useful for the participants uh, and you will try to engage with the network more often uh, through um, email as well as uh, or directly to the uh, presenters of, of the papers and uh, the different uh, sprints, uh, the countries that are leading these uh, activities. And before, before that, I would like to just thank all the presenters uh, for the preparatory work and also the uh, the great uh, presentation and the engagement uh, and the information that has been provided. And also thank uh, uh, Andre and then uh, Benson, uh, as well as the, uh, Daniela and the team uh, from the Bureau who has been uh, instrumental in uh, getting this uh, together. So I look forward to the next uh, quarterly meetings and thank you all for being with us for these two hours. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.